Super high rollers afford us the opportunity to see some of the highest level play in the world. You get players like Jonathan Duhamel, a main event winner, and Tobias Rankenmeyer, a guy who plays all the super high rollers and crushes them regularly play against each other. And that's what this hand is about. And that's kind of important today, especially Jonathan Duhamel's main event win. Why is that, Jonathan? Well, it's because we're going to be live tweeting the main event of the World Series final table all the way throughout, from 9 all the way down to 1. So check out your Twitter machines for that one. We definitely need you to support us in our live <laughs> tweeting, and it's going to be great. You're going to love it anyway. Yeah, come on. It's free. It's free. Anyway, we're going to break this hand down as it goes. We're going to pause it at key points and analyze what these guys are doing, and it's really high-level stuff. This hand was suggested to us by Thomas Doring on Twitter. If you have a hand suggestion, tweet it at us. Still firmly number one. Thank you. Action folded around to Tobias Reinkemeyer at the feature table. He raises from the cutoff to 20,000 with pocket queens. Jack-9 suited for Jonathan Duhamel in the small blind. Usually if you're going to play hands like this out of position, you want to do it with the betting lead. He three bets to 62,000. Gets rid of Seidel in the big blind. So we're back on Reinkemeyer. Tobias could easily put in another bet here. He doesn't. He elects to call. It's a trap! Heads up to the flop. 141,000 in the middle. A jack high flop. Jonathan makes top pair. Oh man, Jonathan is in real trouble here. The Death Star is fully operational. He continues for 63,000. Tobias obviously not going anywhere. He calls. You might wonder why he just called. These guys are super deep, and if you get raised in this flop, you probably puke up the $75 club sandwich you just had for lunch. Six of spades on the turn. Some straight draws and flush draws just came in. Jonathan slows down. His hand and draws not as good anymore. He checks, and Reinkemeyer now bets 160,000. Unfortunately for Jonathan, he's still got to like his hand most of the time, especially given the action so far. Duhamel makes the call. There's some interesting stuff that happens pre-flop and on the flop, but all the stuff, the really cool stuff begins here on the turn when Duhamel decides to check and Rankenmeyer decides to bet. Right, neither of these decisions have to be made, but this spade on the turn really changes the dynamic of the entire hand and changes what the top of value ranges can be. Right, because if Duhamel had a flush, or even by the way the ace of spades in his hand, he would almost certainly bet this turn because of the equity that he would have because he'd be trying to get value. And also, if he has the ace of spades, he'll know that Rankemeyer can't have the nuts, which is a very powerful place to be. Right. He then knows, Duhamel, if he has the ace of spades, that he can bluff basically with impunity if the pot gets really big because he knows that Rankemeyer is going to be terrified of Duhamel's range. Mm -hmm. That is, however, not the case. And Duhamel has a showdownable hand, a reasonable showdownable hand, and he plays it exactly like that. Yeah, he checks. Now, he can also improve to, say, a straight or two pair or trips, which is great. He checks, and Rankemeyer decides to bet, which is also interesting. Sometimes people would check back and overpair here. I like this bet for a number of reasons. One is we wouldn't expect to get raised very often. Two, we can get value out of our queens. We're beating a lot of hands here, and we can knock out some equity hands like ace-king, things like that. Um, and third of all, we uncap our range if we're Rankenmeyer, right? We can have anything here, including uh, the nut flush. Right. Duhamel, by checking on this turn, caps his range in that he no longer is likely to have a flush at all. Right. Rankenmeyer decides not only does he want value, but he also wants to uncap his range in case something comes up on the river, which it might, in <laughs> which he can represent something that he doesn't have. Right. And to be clear, Duhamel can still have the nut flush here. It's just highly unlikely he'd play, or any flush, it's highly unlikely he'd play it this way. Right. Uh, typically, good players are going to have everything in their bag of tri tricks, and Duhamel's a good player, so he certainly could be checking the nut flush here. It just seems like, in general, on its face, kind of a bad play because he's missing out on so much value down the road. You wouldn't expect him to check call with it. It's just not something you'd expect him to see him do. He's a top player. He's up against another top player. He's almost always going to bet it. We're off to the river with nearly 600,000 in the middle. How oh, you think Phil wants him to speed things along? That river card sees Duhamel take the lead. He rivers a straight. Did I say Jonathan was in trouble? I meant to say he's winning. If he wants any value, he's got to try to bet here. Plenty of hands Tobias would just check back. Duhamel counting out a bet of 187,000. I don't think Jonathan's doing this very often as a bluff, and my guess is that Tobias probably knows this too. 
At this point, his hand is pretty much pants. If he's reaching for chips. Raising here would be a really sick play, and make no mistake, it would not be with the assumption that his overpair is the best hand. Those red chips are worth 25,000 each. The blues are worth 5,000. Reinkemeyer raises to 500k. Most players wouldn't even consider raising as an option here, but Tobias is repping a flush, which is a huge part of his range with the line he's taken on this hand. When you call this straight here and lose to a flush, you feel like a complete dodo head. Looks like Jonathan doesn't buy it. Well, he's certainly got to think about it. These are two of the biggest stacks in the tournament. Dormel gives it up. Reinkemeyer turned his queens into a bluff, and that bluff worked. Really sick play by Reinkemeyer. Let's be very clear here that Rankenmeyer is turning his overpair into a bluff. And with that bluff, let's discuss first, what hands is Rankenmeyer targeting? What hands does he think Duhamel could have that Rankenmeyer wants to fold? Great. Um, well, there's there's a lot of hands, actually, I would say. I would say aces, kings, those are two hands that Duhamel might play just like this. Straights, two pair like jack-10, sets, like sets of jacks and sets of tens, specifically. Those are the first things that come to mind for me anyway. Those all make a lot of sense. And that's actually a lot of hands. So yeah. let's, also, uh, let's maybe go with that. Eights. Yeah. 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 Let's go with that. Um, all of those hands. And the reason that Rankemeyer is turning his hand into a bluff is because I think a lot due to Jonathan's sizing on the river, Rankemeyer knows that Jonathan is not bluffing and all of Jonathan's value hands are beating Rankemeyer. Right. Um, I don't think Jonathan's doing this with ace jack almost ever. He's more bluff catching. If he, He's going to consider bluff catching with ace jack, but it's really unlikely he's going to put out a little blocker bet with it. Um, but with the straight, he's trying to get value, as Joe said, actually, um, because so often Rankemeyer is going to check back most of his hands here, including a lot of two pair hands. Even you'd expect him just to check back and over pairs and things like that. Right. But it's possible that Rankemeyer would have checked back had Duhamel checked with the queens. Mm -hmm. But now it feels like Rankemeyer has this real opportunity because on the turn, we talked about how Duhamel's range was capped. Like Duhamel could not have a flush. Right. When Rankemeyer raises, as Joe Stapleton says correctly, he's representing a flush. Never is he representing a straight or two pair. Maybe he can have a straight, but that's extremely unlikely. Mm -hmm. I agree. And Duhamel figures out that he can't beat any value. There's just no value in the world he can beat. If Rankemeyer is raising, he's got Duhamel dead. And so Duhamel decides he just has to fold. Right. And this all goes back to the turn when we were talking about where the caps of each player's range was based on the turn action. Right. This I is the story that Rankemeyer has been telling the whole way. And he's aware that he's telling the story. And he continues to tell it on the river, which is he raises pre. He calls the three bet. He just calls on the flop. When it gets checked to me, bets the turn, he can absolutely have a flush here. And on the river, when he raises, it's the continuation of that same story. He sees it all. He lays it out for Duhamel, and Duhamel believes it. Right. This is a great example of how great players are adaptable throughout a hand because Rankenmeyer's turn bet was not necessarily exclusively in order to represent a flush on the river. Correct. But that was one of the options he left open for himself by making that bet. Mm -hmm. He had other purposes on the turn, such as getting value and having a cheaper showdown sometimes when it's an innocuous river. But on a river like this, where Duhamel clearly is betting for some sort of thin value, Rankenmeyer now knows that with his uncapped range against a good thinking player, he can represent a flush really well. Yeah, and again, this goes back to what you said just a little bit ago. If Duhamel doesn't bet the river, it's quite possible Rankemeyer just checks it back thinking his queens are good enough of the time. But once Duhamel bets that amount, 187 on the river, about a third of the pot, he just Rankemeyer just knows he has to raise or fold. There's no calling here. Right. Uh, a lot of players would think, I have so much showdown value with queens here. I feel like I have to call. I'm getting such a good price. Mm -hmm. But Rankemeyer just knows he's never, ever, ever in a million years ahead here decides that the raise or fold is the only option. And the raise is better because he's really representing such a strong hand. Yeah, and again, since Duhamel can't have it, and the other thing is Rankemeyer knows his customer. He knows Duhamel can find a fold here even with a strong hand, and he's right. Right. Do we think that du Duhamel made a mistake by betting the river here rather than check calling or, or checking and, and just accepting the showdown of his straight? I kind of don't. I actually don't hate this bet at all. I'm not sure about the sizing. The sizing may make it a little too obvious for what it is, but almost never is someone going to raise you as a bluff in this spot with the range that he has. Almost always they're going to call or they're going to raise you with the, with the big hand. 
And so I actually don't know that this is a mistake. What do you think? I don't think it's really a mistake either. He just happened to run into the buzzsaw of brilliance of Tobias's yeah. thought process on this hand because this is one of the most impeccably played hands I've ever seen when you really analyze Tobias's play throughout the hand. Yeah, here. this is not a disastrous mistake. This is an elite play. Stick around because after this, we're going to look at viewer comments from last week's video. If you guys want to see a key hand that enabled Jonathan Duhamel to become that main event winner and play in these super high rollers, check out Birth of a Champion by clicking here. Right there. Also, check out our podcast and make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can get these kinds of videos delivered to your inbox all the time. Last week, we had a hand with Elizabeth Hill, who ended up getting 11th in the 2013 Main Event of the World Series, making a really big play against Marc-Andre Ladusser, where she flopped open-ended, turned a pair that was never any good, turned right. it into a bluff on the turn and the river with really excellent sizing and ended up getting a fold out of the bottom end of a straight, which is basically the top end of what she could get the fold. So it was a really cool play. Yeah, it was pretty great. We actually were thinking she might not be targeting that because it was such a strong hand, but it worked. And we thought it was probably a great play by both players. But let's see what you guys had to say about it. Jeff Malum on YouTube says, I think Hill played the hand well and repped Queen X the best she could. Queen makes the top end of the straight. But Ladusera made what is likely a bad fold, because, since it's unlikely she has Queen X here more than 75% of the time. Right, so what Jeff is referring to is the pot odds that Ladusera is being laid on the river. Hill bets really small on the turn and really small on the river, which is honestly a really good representation of having a queen in her hand. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, she is giving Ladusera a great price to call. To be fair to Hill, I don't think she's really targeting a seven. She's probably no. targeting a two pair type of hand, more likely. Agreed. Um, the other thing is, she called on the flop when he donk bet into her, and so she has to have something. And so he has to basically decide that she's turning one pair into a bluff. Almost always, there's almost no other bluff she can have there except clubs, but he's got two clubs in his hand, so he's got some blockers. Seems to rare. Too. So I think that, yeah, he's getting a good price, but he's usually behind, and I think probably more than 75% of the time, honestly. I think she rarely has a bluff here. Although we haven't seen that many Elizabeth Hill hands, so I can't be 100% sure there. Right on. All right, so uh, another one, Brian Zion on YouTube says, I think Ladusera should continue f firing the turn since he donk bet the flop. I disagree. Um, he can put himself in a really bad spot if he does this, where if she raises, which she very well might do with the top end of the straight here, or by the way, or as a bluff, he kind of has to call and fold almost all rivers that aren't clubs. It's just really hard to call twice with the bottom end of the straight against Elizabeth Hill in particular, who isn't a crazy aggro player or anything like that. Um, it's hard to believe that she would be bluffing there very much. So I don't think he can hero with the bottom end if she raises him at any point. Right, so basically what would happen if he bet and she raised on the turn is this really sticky situation where he's usually going to lose a much bigger pot than he had to because her value range is going to have him crushed unless he hits another club and he just doesn't want to be in that situation on day seven of the main event. The other thing is he's often going to fold out a lot of better, a lot of, excuse me, not better hands than him, but a lot of really good hands that might stick around or might bet but can't really call a bet. Right, it's good for value and good to mitigate variance at the same time. Yep. All right, one last one really got another quickly. One? I'm got gonna a third do one, one more. All right. Randomonium Film says, definitely made me realize I need to balance my smiling range, huge leak. The smiling range comment was a big hit last week, apparently. Yeah, I liked it. Um, but Jonathan in the podcast this week referenced that and made a good point. She actually does have to have a balanced smiling range. That wasn't yeah. just a joke. If she's gonna be smiling at players before they act and hands when they're out of position against her, then she needs to be smiling when she has it and when she doesn't have it. She needs to be smiling the same way. She has to have perfect smiling. It's really hard to do, and it's why most people don't even try and do that kind of stuff. Probably better just to do the poker face. Yeah, don't do any yeah. physical stuff unless you really know what you're doing. Anyway, we will see you guys next week.